Our eyes are one of nature's most fascinating creations. In this animation, we show an incredibly complex organ in a very simple way. The eyes are an important sensory organ for us, which serves to perceive light stimuli from the environment. As the eyes are soft and vulnerable, they are well protected in the hard skull. The eye sockets in which the eyes are located are lined with orbital fat, so that the eyeball, muscles, blood vessels and other tissue are gently embedded in the skull. The cheekbone, frontal bone and other bones form the boundary of the eye socket, which is also known as the orbit. A large number of important pathways reach the eye socket through two orbital fissures. The optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery run through the optic canal. The eye has muscles on the sides that we can consciously control. With the help of these muscles, the eye can be moved. A ring of fibrous tissue is the origin of all muscles except the lower oblique muscle. The interaction of these muscles is incredibly complex, which is why we will go into it in more detail later. The sclera, also known as the white of the eye, is the outer layer of the eyeball. The corneal limbus is the transition zone between the sclera and the cornea. As we can clearly see here, the cornea, unlike the sclera, is transparent. Beneath the sclera, we find a layer that contains an incredible number of blood vessels that supply the eye with oxygen and other nutrients. The fine blood vessels of the choroid extend to the iris. The iris impresses with its brilliant colours, which are caused by pigments. The inner edge of the iris forms the pupil. The light penetrates through the pupil and reaches another layer which is known as the retina. In this layer, there are photoreceptor cells that convert light into nerve impulses. These nerve impulses are transmitted with the help of the optic nerve to the brain. The transition zone between the retina and the ciliary body is known as the aura serrata. Zonal fibers, which are also attached to the ciliary processes, originate from the aura serrata. These zonules are also connected to the lens, which can then be deformed. Let's now look at how the individual areas of the eye work together to enable human vision. First, the light hits the sclera and the cornea. As the cornea is transparent, the light reaches the iris and passes through the pupil. The muscle cells of the iris can constrict or dilate the pupil. When there is little light, the pupil dilates so that more light can enter the eye. When the light is strong, however, the pupil constricts. The muscles in the outer area of the iris are responsible for enlarging the pupil. The muscles in the inner area, on the other hand, are responsible for shrinking it. The iris muscles are controlled by certain nerve cells in the brain. As soon as light hits the photoreceptors located in the retina, such as the photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, electrical signals are transmitted to the brain cells through the optic nerve. The nerve cells in the brain process the information and then transmit electrical signals to the pupil muscles through nerve fibers. The pupil muscles contract or relax due to these electrical signals. This allows the optimal pupil size to be set the retina is also responsible for our ability to see. The fovea centralis is considered to be the central point of the retina with the highest visual acuity. To the right of the fovea, we see how the optic nerve hits the retina. This area is called optic disc. The top layer of the retina is the inner limiting membrane, which consists primarily of Müller glia cells. Müller glia cells have a variety of tasks and run through all layers of the retina. Embedded in the Müller glia cells and directly below the limiting membrane are the nerve fibers that send electrical signals to the brain. There are an incredible number of different cells beneath this layer of nerve fibers, which are also connected to one another by nerve fibers.
deeply embedded in the retina are the most important cells for vision, cones and rods. They are the most important and most common photoreceptors in the human eye. As mentioned, they are deeply embedded in the retina and have numerous cells above them. For this reason, the light must penetrate all layers of the retina before it hits these photoreceptors. Rods are more numerous in the retina and are used for vision in low light, for example at dusk and at night. For vision in bright light, we have cones, of which we have three types, namely for blue, red and green light. As soon as light hits the light-sensitive pigments, an electrical impulse is generated that is transmitted to the brain via nerve fibers. Depending on the strength of the impulse, the patterns and colors we know then arise in our brain. However, this process is a bit more complex. So, let's take a look at this. First of all, all cones and rods are connected to horizontal cells. In this way, horizontal cells can coordinate the signals from all photoreceptors. For the sake of simplicity, we are only showing the horizontal cells of the cones here. The regulation mechanism of the horizontal cells then allows us to see with high contrast. The signal is then transmitted to the bipolar cells, which process the incoming signal again. They inhibit or amplify the signal from the photoreceptors or the horizontal cells. The electrical impulses finally reach the amacrine cells and the ganglion cells. The amacrine cells analyze and influence the impulses that reach the ganglion cells from the bipolar cells. The ganglion cells ultimately transmit the signals to the brain via the nerve fibers. Cones and rods are not evenly distributed across the retina. There are many cones in the center of the retina. This area is called macula. In the center of this macula is the fovea centralis, which has the highest density of cone cells. For this reason, it is the area with the highest visual acuity. Rod cells, which we use for seeing in poor lighting conditions, are not found in the fovea. The area where the optic nerve meets the retina is called the blind spot, and we find neither rods nor cones there. For this reason, we are actually blind in this area. Let's now look at how the images are created in our brain. Here we see light particles from our surroundings. These light particles spread out in a straight line and thus hit the cones and rods of the retina. With the help of the cornea and lens, an inverted, upside-down image of the surroundings is created on the retina. We will explain this in more detail later. Cones and rods, just described, generate electrical impulses from the light particles, which reach the ganglion cells of the retina. The ganglion cells of both right halves of the eye are connected to the right half of the brain through the nerve fibers. With the help of the nerve fibers, the ganglion cells of the right half of the eye now transmit the signals to the right half of the brain, and the ganglion cells of the left half of the eye to the left half of the brain. The electrical impulses reach nerve cells in the brain, known as the lateral geniculate body. They process the signals from the ganglion cells and transmit them to an area known as the primary visual cortex. From here, the impulses flow into deeper regions of the brain, where the signals are ultimately used to recognize color, perceive motion, or recognize contours. Let's now look at how humans can see objects near and far clearly. This ability requires a lens that is attached to the ciliary body using zonules. The ciliary body has muscles that can move the ciliary body, and thus the zonules. When the muscles contract, the lens can relax and return to its original shape. When the muscles relax, the lens is pulled outwards and becomes wider. The lens can be deformed in this way and is thus able to refract the incoming light to different degrees. Let's take a look at this.
the light rays reach the eye and are first refracted by the transparent cornea, causing them to change their direction slightly. These light rays then hit the lens, which causes them to change direction again and finally hit the retina. As we can see, the light rays hit the retina in reverse, creating an upside down image. We have already seen that the shape of the lens can change with the help of the ciliary muscle. The refraction of light can thus be changed. When it comes to seeing near and far objects clearly, this property becomes important. When sunlight hits the same point on an object from all imaginable directions, the light rays are reflected from the surface and then reach the eye and thus the retina. In this case, a small area in the environment should correspond to a small area on the retina. As soon as the object moves further away from the eye, we see that the light is distributed over a large area on the retina. If the object moves closer to the eye again, a single dot appears again on the retina. The reason is the change in the angle at which the light rays hit the cornea and finally the lens. Here, we can clearly see how the angle of the light particles changes for near and distant objects. Humans have a lens so that we can see objects that are far away clearly. As already shown, this lens is able to change its shape and can therefore influence the refraction of light. This is how the focal point is located directly on the retina. So we can say the following. For objects that are far away, the ciliary muscle relaxes and the lens becomes larger. For objects that are close, the ciliary muscle contracts and the lens becomes smaller. However, there are also situations in which the eyeball is deformed. If the eyeball is too long, the focal point is in front of the retina, and if the eyeball is too short, the focal point lies behind the retina. If the eyeball is too long, we speak of near-sightedness, and if it is too short, we speak of far-sightedness. With far-sightedness, the lens cannot shrink any further, which creates a blurred image. If the object moves further away, the image becomes sharp. If the object then moves even further away from the eye, the image becomes blurred again, but the lens can now widen accordingly, which makes the image sharp again. The eye is focused completely automatically by the intraocular muscle. However, we can move some of the extraocular muscles at will to change the direction of view. In the case of abduction, the necessary muscles contract. During adduction, these muscles then relax, and the muscles required for adduction contract. Here is a look at abduction and adduction from above. Several eye muscles also take care of elevation and depression. However, these illustrations are very simplified. In fact, the muscles assume different states of tension and relaxation, depending on the position of the eye. Here again, the elevation and depression from a different perspective. The top of the eye turns away from or towards the nose when we tilt our head slightly to the side. Many more videos about the human body are available on this channel and my websites.